Hi everyone and welcome to Slack Frontiers 2021. We're so glad to have all of you here and we know many of you are dealing with some very difficult times at home, so we're so grateful you could join us today. Some of you have been using Slack for years and some of you are still early in your Slack journey, but for all of you we've put together an exciting, informative and inspiring show today. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. You may not know that we've had a Slack office here for over five years, and unfortunately, I'm not in our beautiful office today. I'm joining you from my home office. Well, sort of. I'm actually sandwiched between my living room and my dining room. But <laughs> either way, I'm thrilled to be with you here today. We wanted to bring you a discussion around the future of work, and let me give you a peek at what you'll hear today. We're going to start with an interview between Stuart Butterfield, our CEO, and Greg Williams, the Editor-in-Chief of Wired UK. We're also going to hear insights from our Chief People Officer, Nadia Rawlinson. She's going to be talking about the future of work and how it relates to people and culture. We're also going to have a discussion from Slack's Head of APAC, Matt Loop. He's going to be talking about how we've seen customers locally embrace the future of work using the Slack platform. You'll also be hearing from some of our younger fans today, and I can't wait to hear what they have to say about the future. And speaking of the future of work, we think this is a moment of possibility. There are new ways to engage customers, new ways of working with our colleagues, and new ways of bringing people together. We think there's a better way to work where we feel more connected, collaborative, and productive. Slack's a powerful way to embrace this future and one that centralizes communication for your organization and provides flexibility to your people. I'm also proud to tell you about our Slack for Good sponsorship. For every person that registered for today's Slack Frontiers event, we're making a generous donation to UNICEF Australia's Emergency Appeal for India. Our friends, families and colleagues are battling a deadly second wave of the pandemic and with your support we're helping UNICEF bring the life-saving supplies to families that desperately need our help. Thank you. Next up, we've got Stuart and Greg discussing the future of work. But before we check out part one of their conversation, let's see what some of tomorrow's Slack employees have to say. Holographic um, computers, um, flying cars, uh, better technology. Good. I think it'll look good. I know. If you're at work and if you're home doing work, um, it's another way you're doing homework. Stuart, great to have you with us here today and really excited to have an opportunity to have a conversation on what the future of work looks like. So, so let's get into it. So first question, clearly uh, the past year has been incredibly challenging both for individuals and organisations. And I'm really interested to get your thoughts. What, what do you think we've learned from this great remote work experiment that we've all been going through? Well, the first and most important thing I think we learned is that it's possible. And I would definitely put myself in the category of people who in February 2020 would have thought like we couldn't all just start working from home and maintain anything like the same level of productivity. And part of that is, you know, just imagining some team working on some project, but it's obviously way more than that. At the time that um, we decided to shut down our offices, there were something like five or 600 on-site interviews scheduled, you know, maybe some of those were weeks or even a couple months away. Um, but the whole recruiting team had to change how they were working and the whole recruiting process had to change. Um, and the same thing is true for new hire onboarding. We used to fly everyone to San Francisco for the first week. And obviously a lot of that was built around in-person meetings and, and contact. 
So it's more than just you know a, a group of marketers launching a website and coordinating their work. It's kind of like every aspect, um, and obviously a uh, huge amount of business travel, salespeople going to meet customers. I was on the road a lot, and all of that kind of ground to a halt too. So the the lesson to take away is I think. If we thought that was impossible, and then when we were forced to do it, it turned out to be possible, what else is possible that we didn't think would be? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I think it has changed. You know, one um, CEO said to me that they thought that the pandemic has reset uh, the art of what's possible. I think that's a really great way um, to frame it. And in this um, hybrid model that you're describing, it, it clearly offers enormous advantages in many ways, both for employers and employees, but there's gonna be challenges. And obviously a lot of employers are going to be worried about productivity. And given that some people will be in the office at different times from others, and some people are going to work remotely full-time and others will want to be back into the office. How do you think about how businesses and organizations can best balance this flexibility that I think most organizations are going to move towards with, but they're also going to need to couple that with the productivity that's needed. One way to, to think about this instead of a slider for the number of days is the degree to which the organization is digital first. Um, and this is very convenient for us as a company that sells software to help people work together um, and probably convenient also, or maybe even self-serving for both us and the people in the audience for this conversation who are kind of leading the charge inside their companies. But it is really true. And, and when I say digital first, um, I have a really specific meaning in mind. I, this phrase could have been around for a very long time, but the first person I ever heard use it was uh, Toby Luca, the CEO of, of Shopify. And this was back in April or May of last year when we were talking about what we will eventually return to. He was the first person I heard say, uh, if there's seven people in a meeting and one of them is remote, we're still all going to get on the Zoom call separately and everyone's going to have their own tile in the meeting, um, which you know, sounds like it's going to be a little bit inconvenient. And it, it might be um, to some extent. It also sounds as someone who was on the road a lot and calling into meetings um, like a godsend because it's so frustrating to be the only person who's, you know, who has two seconds of lag in the conversation um, and can't hear everyone around the room because the microphones aren't well placed and, and all of that. Um, but if you think about it that way, like taking the, the digital first approach, then every bit of in-person interaction is like a bonus, you know, it's some, it's like some additional tool, uh, but it does require more discipline and inconvenience might be the wrong word, but effort, you know, it, it does take more effort. At the same time, you talk to, you know, any, anyone, certainly any manager, any leader, and uh, if you ask them, okay, look, of all the meetings that you're having across the company right now, with the right kind of training, the right kind of techniques, the right kind of like structure and, and process, you know, for example, you know, people like moving to the Amazon style six page memo pre-read instead of slide presentations, or there's always someone responsible for, um, for ensuring that the meeting has a clear agenda and decisions to be made, or, you know, the, all, all these different processes. If you ask people, could your company improve the overall efficacy and, and productivity of its meetings by 20%? Um, almost everyone would say yes. Um, and then, well, if most people are spending most of their day in meetings, why aren't you doing that? You know, because it is, it's hard. It's, uh, you know, if there really was a 20% improvement to be made there and you have 10,000 employees and therefore have, a, you know, like a billion dollars plus in, in payroll costs and people are spending, let's say, half of their time um, on really basic acts of communication and coordination. So not like the interesting, creative, strategic, brainstorm kind of conversation, but more like the update, the status report, the review, the, you know, all of that stuff. Um, it's not that those things are unimportant. You know, I think they're actually critically important because that's how you stay aligned and you're able to accomplish things with a large group of people and especially really complex projects that take a long time and, and involve like hundreds or even thousands of people. Um, but it is a tremendous amount of effort. And you know, so why, why don't we do that? Why don't we put that effort in? And when you start to move digital first, I think it's an opportunity to re-examine the ways that you're working 
um, see which ones serve you and which ones don't and kind of what things you'd like to change in the future because that requirement of more discipline, the, the, the six people who are in the office all getting on the Zoom separately, the um, more careful use of um, documentation to support asynchronous style meetings or to support people in multiple time zones. Um, you know, all of that effort, I think, has a, has a huge payoff and maybe we can piggyback our way in this world where we have to change all these things to uh, create some of those changes which we hope that we would have made all along. We'll come back later for part two of the conversation. Next, we're going to hear from our Chief People Officer, Nadia Rawlinson, on the people and culture side of things. But first, another word or two from our little sponsors. Walk and cook. What so then we can have money? I don't know what you do, so no. He works for marketing operation. He almost never gets a break. You tell people if their art is good or bad. Animation and cool um and cool um stuff. Look. Ah. She makes money. You never really explained it to me. everyone and welcome. I'm coming to you from my home in Chicago, Illinois in the U.S. and I'm excited to share with you today what we've learned at Slack in navigating work during these unprecedented times. We're embracing the future of work because we've seen how it can improve connections between people, how we can be more productive, and evolve our culture in important ways. I'll also share some tips for leaders on how to navigate this new normal. You know, I can speak from personal experience because I joined Slack in the middle of the pandemic back in September. I've never even met my peers or exec team in person, including Stuart Butterfield, our CEO. Prior to the pandemic, we were surprised to learn that only 3% of Slack was remote. So this was a big change for us, but it was an opportunity for us to lead in the space. As professionals around the world, we experienced the collapse of the personal and our working lives into one. Social systems were tested, healthcare systems were stressed to the max, we had to figure out how to homeschool our children, and we also had to take care of loved ones. But during this time, we gained a new level of flexibility. Inclusion became a centerpiece of how we worked together, and connection became that much more important. We discovered, yeah, this feels different, but it's possible. We can be productive, we can launch new products, hire and onboard people. You know, at Slack, 30% of our entire workforce to date has been hired during the pandemic. So we can be effective, and we also can find balance in our lives. Many of these insights led us to establish the Future Forum, a think tank Slack sponsors to create original research on the topics of the future of work. For instance, in the US, underrepresented groups which are made up of Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians, find a higher sense of belonging than their peers, which was an unexpected result of the pandemic. We wondered, why could that be? It turns out, people can just bring their whole selves to work. There's less code switching. And by that, I mean the way that we change the way we speak, dress, and act in order to make other people feel comfortable and to fit into a group. And quite frankly, it can be exhausting. Underrepresented minorities really do feel a sense of belonging in this distributed work environment. 64% of us feel a greater boost in the ability to even manage stress and a 25% greater improvement in work-life balance. We now have the opportunity to take what we've learned during this time and leverage technology to be the great democratizer. Employees want flexibility because they have lives. One of the other things that we learned at the Future Forum is that 83% of professionals don't even want to go back to the office full-time. They prefer flexible, hybrid working environments. 
Now here is the opportunity for leaders. First, we need to set expectations for hybrid work, shift to a digital-first approach, not in an office or in-person approach. Next, we need to get creative about new ways to measure progress. Hours in the office and FaceTime just won't cut it anymore. We need to redefine and evolve our cultures by listening to our people and adapting to what they need. No one nails it on the first try, but it's important to try at all. Slack as a platform can help improve the connection between people and your culture. I found at Slack that we have a very unique culture that's intentional, people-centric, and highly collaborative. And for me, it's shown up in a couple of different ways. For instance, we have what we call Fridays, a once a month Friday off holiday in order for our people to prevent burnout. This allows for people to spend time on things other than work, connecting with friends and family or just doing what they love. And what's more important about this Friday is that all of us as leaders also take the Fridays. It's important to model this behavior from the top. And on Mondays, I come back and hop into some of our uh, communities and connections and talk about those activities that I did on Friday to make sure we're reinforcing those norms. We also have culture channels that create communities around a certain topic or interest, such as doodles or cooking. And I've really gotten into those over the pandemic. Doodles are for people who have dogs that are mixed with poodles. I have Miles. Um, he's my favorite. Don't tell Herbie that. Um, and we post pictures of them uh, throughout the week around some of the things that dogs do. There's also in the cooking channel, I'm learning to become a master chef at making pasta from scratch. And so I have a community of people to help me along on my journey. And it's really great to be able to have those moments when we can step away, but in with, within Slack and learn from other people that are outside of my day-to-day -day team about things that are of personal interest to me. All of these connections though, are supported by some of the features that our platform offers. These are capabilities that enable us to exist in some of those cultural connection channels. For instance, we take Fridays. Um, you can update your status by saying Nadia Rawlinson, my name, and a status update saying Friday with a great emoticon. So people know that I'm taking advantage of the holiday. We also have automated time zones. And so people understand your working hours and when it's best to connect with you. But finally, if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you just want to put head, your head down and get stuff done, there's the option to pause all notifications altogether so you really can focus on getting work done. I promised when we first met that I'll give a few tips for leaders as you navigate this next year. First, be curious. Be a student of your own culture. Learn how it works and how it's evolving. When I first came to Slack, I was really surprised at how open and candid our conversations were. I started poking around our culture channels and saw one of our behavioral tenants is to embrace the elephant. And by that I mean, go after and say the hard thing. It's allowed us to have very direct and clear communication, which has really made us better. Second, be intentional. Don't assume things will evolve as they should. Make the implicit explicit and always over communicate. And lastly, be authentic. Admit that all of this is hard. Ask the hard questions of yourself and others, but also engage on personal topics. People want to see that you're human too. So here's what I want all of us to remember. This is our first global pandemic. It's impacting our lives in personal and professional ways. As leaders, give yourselves permission to try things, explore something new as we move forward. One thing's for sure, the vision is clear. This is our opportunity to redefine the future of work and make a difference in organizations for decades to come. Thank you, Nadia, for reminding us that this new work environment can give more of us the opportunity to bring our whole selves to work. I love that. And as you pointed out, Slack has a pretty amazing culture. The platform is both our culture and our business. Next up is Matt Loop, Slack's head of APAC. Matt's going to talk to us about how we see customers today using Slack locally to embrace the future of work and run their own businesses. Thank you, Julie. Hello and welcome to our guests across Australia, New Zealand, India, and broader Asia Pacific. I'm speaking with you from Sydney, Australia, from my home office. And I'm really excited to be celebrating five years of Slack here in the Asia Pacific region. 
We launched our headquarters in Melbourne last five years ago in March. And like all of you, we had no idea what 2020 and our fifth year in this market would bring. I'm here to share a few specific things with you today. How we see businesses and users thinking about the future of work, how we've seen our customers and our own employees thrive using Slack, and some practical steps that you can take today to put into your own business to better embrace the future of work. According to Future Form Research, 83% of all knowledge workers do not want to go back to five days a week in a physical office. This preference is stronger in our younger workers, over half of our workforce, who want, actually demand, a hybrid or fully remote model. It's clear that the future of work is hybrid. During a tumultuous year, Slack served our customers by helping them stay aligned, productive, and connected. Many started using Slack for the first time. We saw a huge jump in paid customers in Australia over the last 12 months, growing 93% year on year. And for those who are already using Slack, this was the year they started using it even more. The average number of minutes Australian users were connected to Slack increased by 29%. Slack's own shift to remote work in 72 hours was relatively seamless because we relied on our own platform. We drank our own champagne. We didn't send everyone home and tell them to get on email to get work done. And neither did many of you. So let's talk about email. Our 50-year-old friend created in the disco era of the 1970s for a government use case. I think we can all admit that it was not designed for the complexity of today's work. According to a recent Wakefield research study, Slack users worldwide estimate they save an average of 90 minutes a day using Slack instead of email. That's seven and a half hours, almost an entire working day each week. And it's not just about saving time either. 96% of users believe they can forge better connections with their leaders via Slack than email. And nearly half of IT decision makers predict another form of digital communication will completely replace email in the next three years. We heard a lot about meetings too. Slack users tell us 40% of phone or video meetings could have easily been replaced with a simple Slack message. Could you imagine if nearly half of your meetings just disappeared from your calendar? I came from 20 years of being an office bound leader. I did not think we could be productive remotely, but that simply wasn't borne out in our experience. And it wasn't just my experience. We surveyed 1,000 Australian knowledge workers and found 82% felt empowered by technology they use when working remotely. And over half of them reported increased productivity. But it wasn't all positive. Two key pain points emerged as hampering people's ability to get their jobs done. First was app proliferation. Juggling the sheer number of apps they interact with on a daily basis. It was estimated Two hours a week, that's 12 whole working days every year, was spent doing that. The second, lack of access to information, which was identified as one of the biggest workday frustrations. 68% said they could do their job better if they had better access to information. And here's a big one for you if you're a manager. Over half the respondents felt they could do their boss's job if they had access to the same information that you did. So how does Slack help? Slack is a messaging app for business that lets you organize conversations into channels. With Slack, people can work together more effectively, connect all their software tools and services, and find the information they need to do their best work, all within a secure, digital-first, enterprise-grade environment. It's never been more important to bring everyone together in one place and be aligned. And in fact, many of our customers see Slack as their digital headquarters. Sendle is the first 100% carbon neutral delivery service in Australia and in the US. Our mission is to create shipping that's good for the world. And by good, we mean shipping that's good for small businesses and also good for the environment. We've got folks over in Manila, people in Seattle, a team here in Sydney and Australia and remote employees all over Australia. So we really need a platform like Slack. So Slack is built for everyone, no matter how you communicate. 
everything that you would have had in the physical office from your engineers coming over and talking to your product managers to your marketing team talking to your customer success team to PNC needing to announce something to the whole team. We use Slack for all of those communications and really nothing is lost. We even communicate via secure channels with our partners and external vendors such as Shopify and Stripe. My current people and culture team are 100% remote. Um, we have never actually all met in person. We all live in different regions of the world and our entire communication is done online virtually and in Slack. Slack provides open, transparent communication, which is so important when you're a remote company spread across four countries doing highly technical work. Whether you're a new hire, whether you have been at Sendle for five years, you can come to Slack, find the information you need in real time, and really making that a much more streamlined experience. It is our town hall, it is our virtual office, it is the space in which we have every interaction as a company and a business. So one of the really important things for me as CTO is to be available for my team. So Slack enables that by allowing me to uh, just have this sort of open door policy without actually having to have an office. The traditional dynamic that you get in an office where the loudest person is always heard isn't necessarily the case in Slack. Some of our quieter team members are often the loudest, as it were. Folks who are more traditionally introverts really come to life uh, in that space and really communicate who they are through our Slack channels. Within product engineering, we've got two main channels that are used for dealing with operational issues. So we have a notifications channel that tells us if there's anything wrong, and then we have a chat channel that runs alongside that, that um, lets us resolve any incidents that might pop up or discuss, uh, troubleshoot, um, dig into anything that people might need help with. So we use the GitHub integration to feed through any information about code review or any changes that are happening to the system, but all of that integrates into Slack as the hub for information anyway. You'll set up a video call and you'll do that straight from Slack, or you might open some tasks on Trello and you can even just create a task within a Slack channel and just opens it in Trello automatically. The Sendle and Shopify partnership was of such high stakes that we need to be sure we had a secure platform on which to communicate and Slack was able to provide that for us. The way we used Slack Connect allowed our product team to speak to Shopify's product team and our engineers to really connect and troubleshoot together on any issues that they had. The amount of time we would have spent in meetings, waiting for time zones, uh, connecting through presentations and various emails uh, would have been a really, really complex project. So through Slack Connect, we were able to do that asynchronously across many time zones and really efficiently. So if we think about what we used to wake up to, which for me is hundreds of emails, whereas when you start working with Slack, everything's triaged. So you're already in your established groups, whether it be with my team, my executive team, the whole company. It's also a living archive of everything that has been. If an employee leaves, you're still able to look back over the information or data they might have shared and use that. And that's very different to the world we used to be in. Slack's been absolutely vital in the way that we operate at Sandal. And I think with add-ons and additional integrations and new channels and new members, I can only see us growing well into the future. At the end of the day, Slack simplifies your working life. I'd like to tell you about three big benefits. First, Slack is a unique platform that helps centralize information. Slack also fosters asynchronous and synchronous communication. And finally, Slack enables more collaboration. Once all communication gets moved into channels, everyone knows where to go to ask questions, give updates, and get caught up. It brings the right people, information, and tools into one place, moving work forward with a common purpose and place. Our platform enables you to integrate different apps, allowing you to do things like look up quick account information in Salesforce or approve expense reports without ever having to leave Slack. By using what we call workflows, you bring the right information to the right people, right where they're working in real time. And one really exciting way to do this is through a tool called Workflow Builder, a feature that we're continuing to build upon. So what is Workflow Builder? It's a visual tool that lets anyone in Slack automate routine tasks. And you can connect to all your favorite apps with no coding required. Yeah, that means you don't have to be a developer to use this. A great example of how I've used Workflow Builder is to automate onboarding, especially as we've moved to remote and brought people on from their own homes. 
Workflow Builder helps me get the relevant reminders of events that happen in a new hire's day or week, and it prompts me to send the right updates, welcome messages, set up follow-up meetings, and do it all at the right times. What this does is it ensures a seamless and positive onboarding experience for each team member. For Slack, the future of work is a model that strikes the right balance between synchronous and asynchronous work. That is, work done together at the same time versus work done individually at different times. I'm really excited about Slack's innovation in this space, particularly two new collaboration tools that we're prototyping that enable people to work or communicate at a time and in a way that's best for them. Communication does not always need to happen in real time, in person or over video calls. And one example of this is asynchronous video. We want to replace the countless hours of in-person meetings and unnecessary, inefficient, synchronous meetings. So we're coming up with new ways to use video to communicate. We're working on a feature that allows you to record a video snippet and then to post it into channel for your team to view at a time that suits them, making it more inclusive for those in different time zones and those with different communication styles. An example in my own workday has been replacing our weekly stand-up meeting, where the content was typically a two to three minute round the room update where each of the team members would kind of tell everyone what was happening in the activities in their week ahead. Instead, we killed this meeting and we moved to a simple two minute video update that goes into channel where team members can consume that on their own time. And we also see the value in providing people with the tools they need to drive more casual synchronous collaboration, similar to what you'd have in an office environment. Because channels are where work's already happening, there's a huge opportunity to bring that directly into Slack. And one example of this is lightweight audio. Enabling always available audio only interactions that foster the kind of spontaneous collaboration that we're missing from not being in office together. So with Slack, collaboration is always happening whenever, wherever, however, it's best for it to happen. And one particularly helpful tool that aids with this is Slack Connect. More and more companies need to find ways to connect with customers and the game-changing tool for myself, our sales teams, and many of our customers has been Slack Connect. My job used to revolve around a lot of face-to-face -face travel, but I'm actually connecting with even more CIOs and senior leaders than before the pandemic due to Slack Connect. So what is Slack Connect? Well, once you've experienced Slack internally, you'll want to use it to communicate externally too. Slack Connect allows you to do that, extending the benefits of channels, including that same speed and security that you're used to, to any organization you work with. It has the potential to transform the way organizations work together. And we've recently launched Slack Connect Direct Messages, a way to securely direct message anyone at any organization you work with. In fact, our biggest active opportunity with one of the ASX20 companies, we're using Slack Connect to work together all in one place. We're sharing files and messages. We're using casual language like GIFs and emojis. We've integrated into the applications that we both use like Zendesk and Google Drive to be more productive. Slack's core product roadmap is focused on encouraging flexible, inclusive, and connected ways of working. We're making digital first solutions work for everyone in every situation. And we're challenging rigid barriers that no longer apply to modern day work with tools and capabilities in Slack that allow people to create, consume, and act upon critical information. All over the world, leaders are facing a new future of work. Where you are on this track depends on what country you're in, but it's clear that many of us are looking forward to a working world that's predominantly hybrid. And with this in mind, I'd like to share some basic practical tips for leaders making the transition to hybrid work. First, set really clear expectations about how to use Slack across each function in your business. Second, make use of our various resources, both on our website and through your account teams. And last, connect Slack to your critical applications and tools. We have north of 2,400 applications in our app directory, include things like Google Calendar, Microsoft OneDrive, and Zoom. And we like to say that Slack is the 2% of your software budget that makes the 98% more effective. At Slack, we consider ourselves so lucky and blessed to work with companies of all sizes across all industries 
especially now as we collectively begin to plot out a new future, leaving the old normal behind for a better way of working. We're especially thankful for all of our Asia-Pacific customers who've been such strong supporters of Slack. Thank you very much for your commitment and your partnership. We hope to have the opportunity to speak with you and with others who want to learn about the topics we'll be covering at Slack Frontiers Asia Pacific. The future starts today, and I hope you enjoy the session. Thanks so much for joining. Afterpay is a global buy now, pay later platform, which means you can buy a product and pay it off in four equal installments. Slack's used by all employees, used across all the enterprise, so technology is a major user, obviously with uh, integrations for our product or monitoring, etc. Um, our marketing team use it across various third parties to interact, commercial, uh, and also directly with our merchants as well. As Afterpay's grown um, so quickly, we've expanded into multiple regions which have many different time zones, so challenge around our follow the sun support model as an example. We're in the US, we're in the UK, we're just launching in Europe now. We actually have a technology centre based in Shanghai in China, so actually trying to sync all of those uh, time zones up. Slack's been great because we can, you know, people can ask a question and someone else from a different area can respond to it. Prior to Slack being used more broadly, you know, as part of the pandemic and ongoing as the enterprise grew, email would have been very slow and cumbersome to engage with all of our team members. So Slack's really brought everyone into the one place if they needed help with setups or ongoing support. So Global IT Support Channel was created last February uh, and that's been one of our biggest wins to date to actually have one place where people can actually come in and either look through and see where other people have had issues and, and piggyback off the back or log a new request for help. We've onboarded more than 300 people over the last 12, 18 months, and that continues to grow significantly. One key call out there is, you know, the return after Christmas, um, the backlog of staff coming on board. We had, we did 40 people in a single day globally around onboarding and using Slack to ensure that they were getting the right access to either internal teams or managers and, and so forth. And then once everyone is on board, we do have a dedicated channel that allows new starters to engage with HR and IT support. Really what we wanted to do there was give everyone a one-stop shop to actually come and collaborate and get everything that they needed to do so that they weren't spending days or hours or weeks trying to get up to go with their role. Our most recent and largest integration has been our ServiceNow integration for our IT support team. The automation of creating a ticket without someone having to post something into a Slack channel saying, I need help with this, has saved lots of headaches around using multiple systems to try and get help. So really that one-stop shop is, is key. So Slack overall is fundamental to us being able to engage with all of our partners or third parties and also our internal teams. Having our customer operations centres, our outsourced customer operations centres on our Slack Connect channels just allows everyone to be way more interactive. So operations teams in Manila or Texas can all jump in and help each other as part of that. I think the ultimate outcome there is that our end users who are having an issue and calling our customer operations teams have their issue resolved faster. The other key around that is being able to escalate to someone in either a different region, time zone, or just to a more senior person. Since switching to Slack Connect, we've been able to resolve our customers' issues way faster than what we were over any traditional collaboration. I think our continued use of Slack will grow as the organisation and the enterprise has actually grown over the last 12, 18 months. We'll see rapid expansion into new regions and also the ability for us to integrate into third parties will make it easier for us to collaborate. Hockey player. Be a ballerina and a single. A construction worker. A police officer because I like the bad guys. I want to be a police officer when I'm a big, big adult, like 30 or 25. Eh? Eh? Archaeologist. Help other people get food in other countries. I hope you like this video. I love hearing directly from our customers about how Slack is changing the way they work. 
It was the same for me. I, I was a Slack user before I joined the team, but I've learned so many more features and capabilities these last few years from that very first day I started. The Remind Me feature helped me keep on top of all of the things I needed to do. Can't believe I went without it for so long. Now, let's get to the final segment of our conversation between Stuart and Greg. Did you make any organizational changes in order to ensure agility or, or to build resilience? Anything you, uh, you could share maybe with other organizations? I think there wasn't, at my level, there wasn't like a top-down decision and then you know, like different divisions of the company reorganized. There was a lot of bottoms-up, team-level um, experimentation and kind of ad adoption of, of new approaches. Uh, and again, that can be because you're not in the, um, in the office at the same time as people, you need some means of, of supplementing that uh, kind of the ambient information that people need in order to really have a shared idea of what's happening. And that in, in the military, they sometimes call it situational awareness. Um, having that uh, is really necessary. And so people would find other ways. And it also forced a lot of experimentation and ultimately innovation on the product side of Slack as well. Because I think there's two areas which we thought were especially interesting and valuable. And one was um, trying to recreate some of the serendipity and spontaneity of in-person conversations through a, a feature called Huddles. I think that's what we're going to call it publicly. It's testing with a bunch of, of customers right now. But Unlike a call which starts and stops and you know I call you and then your phone rings and you have to answer it right then, um, it's an always on audio channel. And Slack already you know, has the advantage of, of people have created all these channels and they obviously are intended to mirror the priorities and, and structure of the organization itself. There's a, you can have a channel for every customer, every project, every business unit, office location. Um, and you can just enter the huddle by yourself and have your speakers on and be working away. And if someone else joins and they say something, you'll just hear them, you know, like you would overhear someone at your desk. And it exists, again, whether you leave or enter. So it's not intended for, you know, huge groups or, you know, a thousand people or something like that. It's really intended for the people that you work with most closely, you know, five people, eight people, really at, at the, the team level. But teams that are working closely with each other all day, having this uh, ability to have the conversation right now uh, turns out to be super valuable because often the alternative is let's find a time when we can all meet and that can't happen till next Thursday and it's a half hour slot. So rather than being a two minute conversation right now and the, you know, the kind of the work is unlocked and you can keep going this afternoon, it becomes, okay, now we're gonna put this thing on hold and, and defer the decisions until we can all get together. And because we scheduled half an hour, we're gonna use the whole half hour. The other one is um, uh, doesn't have any kind of public name. We've, we've talked about stories because one of the, the instruments is like short videos like Instagram stories or Snapchat stories. But the idea is to create um, a container for an asynchronous meeting. So this, again, this is not the marketing version of it, but um, a meeting object. And you can attach the agenda, you can attach like the presentation or planning materials, supplemental like references, uh, technical documentation or proposals. Uh, and rather than say, okay, it's 1130 now on Tuesday. And so everyone stop what you're doing, regardless of how in, in the moment, how, how in flow you are. Uh, and we're going to have this meeting right now you have the opportunity to spread it out over, let's say, 17 hours. And there's many advantages to that, but the biggest one is it gives people some flexibility. And any process that today must be synchronous, in other words, people have to do it at the same time, that you can make asynchronous, uh, even if it doesn't reduce the total number of hours worked, is still enormously valuable to people. Because some people like to work early in the morning, some people would rather work in the evening, some people want to be able to get some exercise in the middle of the afternoon. And if you're like in lockstep, you know, from nine to five with every half hour being a new video call that you're doing, it, it, there's a little bit of, um, tyranny might sound overblown, but I think it, you know, it is a hangover of the industrial revolution when we made the transition from people being paid from what they produced. So if you're a baker, it's like how many loaves of bread can you bake 
and, and sell to their time. Um, and when you start paying people for their time, just for logistical reasons, you have to have them all start and stop at the same time. And you have to have a whistle that blows on the factory floor and everyone from 10.10 to 10.20 can go have their tea or something like that. Um, and that's really, it takes away a lot of autonomy and, and I think probably ultimately a lot of people's ability to contribute. And the last thing I would say is, of course, it helps people with multiple time zones. It also helps people who like to take a little bit more time to formulate their thoughts before giving feedback. So rather than we have 30 minutes in this meeting, 20 minutes of is, is me giving you a presentation, and now you have 10 minutes to both think through, you know, to kind of process it, synthesize your feedback, and communicate it. And if you don't do it then, that, you've lost your chance now. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's definitely something we should overcome. So on the product front, uh, there was a major milestone with Slack Connect. Um, what's the uptake been like? Um, it's been pretty incredible. So there's, I, I'm not sure what the absolute latest numbers are, but uh, I think 74,000 different organizations that are using it. Uh, that's up more than 100% over the year. But the number of connections between them, because it's not always just one company to one other company. It can be one company to many other. Um, the rate of those, what we call connected endpoints, was 245% year on year. So with really um, exceptional growth. And what people are finding is it's... Uh, it's so much easier to support your customers using a shared channel that the same amount of effort creates a much better customer experience. And if you have happy customers, that's good for you. So we, what we find is people on the sell side, you know, people who sell software, uh, people who sell other services, uh, a lot of the world's biggest consulting organizations, a lot of the uh, world's biggest um, purchasers as well uh, are, are in on it because they want to receive that level of, res of responsiveness and, and support. It's actually been entirely driven by customers coming up with new use cases. And um, it's really exciting because this was part of the vision of Slack from the very beginning. It took us years and years to get to this point, but now that it's happening, it's kind of you know everything that we dreamed of. Stuart, we're, we're over time. It's always so, so fascinating uh, to hear your thoughts. Uh, and it's clearly such an important topic. It's going to be a fascinating uh, few months as all of us figure out what the future of work looks like. Um, Stuart, thank you so much for joining us and stay safe. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Stuart and Greg, for such an insightful conversation. And that brings us to the end of our opening keynote. Thank you to our keynote speakers, our Spotlight customers, and especially those adorable kids. Next up, we have a full program for you. Create your own event and choose from breakout sessions, demos, and panels with live Q&A. Or connect with other folks in a brain date or in the Slack workspace. And don't forget to tune in for the closing keynote featuring vocal artist Box of Beats and four-time Olympic gold medalist Venus Williams. Thank you and enjoy Frontiers 2021.